Okay, so I guess we'll get started. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us for our second part of our series. Um, today, uh, Dr. Kwasnick will be telling us all about deworming in dollars, uh, the value of strategic parasite control programs. Um, so feel free to ask questions, um, join in, don't be shy. <laughs> Um, and again, we'd, we'd like to thank Zoitis for uh, providing Dr. Kwasnick to us and take it away. Oh, right on. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And welcome back to those of, us, of you who joined us for the first installment of the series where we talked about the importance of enhanced immunity and dental care for our horses. And on today's installment, we're going to discuss what the current recommendations are in parasite control and how setting up a strategic control program can be best for your horse, for the environment, and your bank account. So I'm just going to pop off camera here so I can switch my screens around a little bit, but uh, sit back. Hope we have a, a nice beverage to, to nurse as we go through our session for the next hour here and just really equip you with best practices for parasite control in your horses. So for those of you who like to know where we're headed, here's a quick outline. We will talk about why strategic programs are necessary, how to implement them, how they compare in cost to traditional systems, and a few tips for submitting samples. But to start, I'm going to get up on my soapbox for a moment here. The protocols where every horse in a herd is dewormed every two to three months year round is no longer recommended practice. If this is what you have been doing, don't hang your head. That protocol had its day, but that day really has passed. I think if you're here listening, you are wanting to do what is best for your horse. So let's talk about why we have to move away from these programs that have been in place for the last 30 to 40 years, essentially. The main reason is that the main parasite affecting horses has changed. Previously, we were targeting the large strongiles or bloodworms. The programs of the last few decades have done their job in greatly reducing the large strongile population to the point where they are only seen rarely. The flip side of those programs is that while the focus was on large strongile control, because they were the ones that caused the really scary blood clot induced colic, the small strongiles in ground and now the major parasite of concern. And the small Steindales, they did this in the face of routine deworming treatment. Resistance to amongst the small Steindales is quite common. And as a result, our strategy needs to change too. So we need our strategy so that we can target the major parasites to limit their numbers and reduce the impacts on overall health. Our domestic horses, being more confined and exposed to infection pressure than their free roaming counterparts tend to carry a higher burden than what nature would have intended. It's our management of, of horses domestically that have, has skewed, skewed that balance. So we also need to be strategic to limit the number of treatments that are administered. So yeah, let that thing sink in for a second. This is me here, someone from a drug company telling you that overall we want you to use less of the product, but more effectively. And this is to minimize the, the development of resistance as well as encouraging environmental stewardship. It's also important to realize, and you can see that I'm still up on my soapbox here, that what you decide makes a difference for your horse. This isn't some you know, fluffy in the sky concept of do it for the greater good type of thing. It's your choices and practices that will largely determine the impact parasites have on your horse and the likelihood that resistance will develop within your herd. So let me step down off my soapbox for a moment and uh, have Jocelyn pop up our first polling question. Yeah, so think of the last dormer you administered to your horse. How did you choose it? So it was on sale at the feed store. It was what my vet recommended. 
You know, the tube I found in the door of my trailer, I don't administer conventional dewormers to my horse. I read the label to determine that it targeted the parasites of concern in my horse or the flavoring sounded most appealing. And, you know, it's okay to be honest. Again, these are anonymous answers and it's a judgment free zone here. Just waiting for the, the answers to pop up if everybody's answered. Or Jocelyn, do you do you see the answers? How people responded? Oh, here they are. All right. Okay. So some good responses here. It was on sale at the feed store, and you know that's honestly a <laughs> a, a pretty good honest answer. Um, it was what my vet recommended. That's that's good to hear that you're working in conjunction with your vet. And then we have some label readers, so that that is good. A nice uh, mix here of, of answers from from the crowd. So we'll we'll address the, the product selection a, a little bit a little bit later, but it's clear there's a lot of different factors beyond just science that go into to what we're selecting for our horses. But what a strategic program boils down to is you need to use the right product at the right dose in the right horse at the right time. So if you can only remember one slide from today, let it be this. All these different components alongside management strategies are critical pieces of a strategic parasite control program. So sometimes we can get lost in the jargon and, and get panicked about these control programs. And I'm raising my hand, vets included, and just revert back to those old blanket protocols. They were simple, they were reflexive, but we really can't do that. We do need to do better. We only have to look over the fence to see problems that sheep and goat producers are having with parasite resistance. There are animals dying from overt parasitic disease. And here with our horses, we're not as far up that creek yet. So we can really take the opportunity to get things turned around before things are in really dire straits. But to develop a strategic control program, we really need to answer only a few key questions. Who needs to be treated? When do they need to be treated? And what do we treat them with? So let's take a look at, at how to answer each of those questions. When it comes to parasitism, not all horses are created equal. In fact, they vary greatly in their ability to manage their small strontile burdens with their immune system. Like many other host species, parasitism in horses follows an over-dispersed pattern. So this is, means that 80% of the eggs come from only 20% of the horses. It's important to note that we can't detect those 20% of horses who are producing the 80% of the eggs with our naked eye. There's no breed, color, or gender predilection. And keep in mind, I'm not talking about that pot-bellied, rough-coated yearling that even a second-year vet student could pick out as having a parasite load. I'm talking about the true high shedders that are otherwise happy, hay-burning worm factories. Since we can't pick them out by visual inspection, we do have to do some microscopic analysis of samples to determine who to focus our attention on. The most routine and non-invasive way to do this is by doing a fecal egg count. And these are simply done by putting a sample of your horse's manure through a calibrated process that recovers the parasite eggs that are then counted under a microscope. So once we've picked out who needs to be done, we need to determine when to deworm. And there are a few factors that go into determining that, but chiefly the season, when and what a horse was previously dewormed with, as well as factoring in the likelihood of exposure through grazing access and other management practices form when we deworm our horses. This brings us to poll question number two. 
So at what time of year is a deworming treatment indicated for every horse, regardless of what their fecal egg count is? This question does just raise a few key points. Fecal egg counts are a routinely used tool, and it's probably our best tool that we have for quickly determining the strong bowel contamination potential. But there are some limitations. Sometimes we don't, the parasite is not at a stage where it's producing eggs yet, only the adults are, are producing eggs, and it's the stages earlier that are, that are involved in the worm burden, or it's parasites that their eggs aren't routinely recovered on our normal fecal egg count, like the tapeworm egg. We need to do a different style of, of um, test for those, and those eggs are only intermittently shed, shed, so it's good to have just a baseline treatment for one. And I could see a, a breakdown of responses there, but the correct answer is fall. Um, so if you said fall, you're, you're correct. Uh, close second would be a springtime treatment, but in the fall, that's the time of year as horses are coming off grazing, that their small strongile burdens are the highest, and it's a, a good time to control the other parasites like bots, tapeworms, and large strongiles. The AEP recommends one to two treatments per horse per year as a foundation for all mature horses. It's important to not deworm year-round in our climate. And so that's the, we don't need to deworm in, in winter up here in the north. If we're deworming during seasons where their parasite burdens are naturally more dormant and there's little larval development, such as during extreme cold and then also during extreme heat, we can increase selection pressure for resistant parasites. So that's why we focus on treating more during the spring, the summer, and the fall, and avoiding treating during the winter. Another factor to keep in mind is how long are the products expected to be effective for? The egg reappearance period is the amount of time between when the product is administered to your horse and then when parasite eggs can next be detected in the manure. You can see that there are varying lengths of ERPs, and important to know that these periods have gotten shorter over the years as efficacy decreases or resistance increases. So keep this in mind when you're thinking about when do I next deworm my horse, it very much depends on what was used previously. Because to minimize selecting for resistance, we want to allow that ERP to lapse before deworming again. And this brings us to the question of what to use. And this is often the most confusing piece, right? Just choosing what to use, you know, our, our First polling question shows that there's a few more factors than just science that, that factors into this. But some big questions that need to be asked are, is it targeting what I need it to? And then secondly, is it efficacious in my horse herd? That is to say, are there resistant parasites within my horses? And then finally, is it safe to use in my horse? So as I mentioned previously, our main parasite of concern is now the small strongyle. They are really aptly named because you can hardly see the adult worms on this fecal ball, and you're not really going to reliably see them either, you know, dead adults uh, being shed in the feces after deworming. So that's one of the reasons we can't rely on just visual appearance of either the horses or the fecal balls to, to diagnose the presence of parasites. But when present in large numbers as larval stages in the wall of the intestine or colon, they can limit the nutrient absorption and either create some fibrosis or scarring in areas when they emerge from the wall of the colon. And this is particularly problematic when they are present in really high numbers or when they all emerge at one time. And that's a condition that's called larval cyathostomosis, which 
as you can imagine, becomes life-threatening and is very key, difficult to, to treat medically. So it does carry a poor prognosis. So it's those insisted stages that we're particularly interested in in the small strongyl. Another parasite of interest in the adult horse is tapeworms. And so this is um, near the ileocecal junction, which is kind of a, an anatomical narrowing of the GI tract anyways. And then these hang out near that ileocecal valve and they can create problems as they alter motility and, and they can lead to impactions in, in that region. So bots, we have an internal picture of the bots. We're probably more familiar with this, the little yellow eggs on hairs on our horses that uh, we'll see late summer and, and into fall, but those eggs are ingested by the horse and they actually migrate through the tissue of the mouth to make it down into the stomach where they larvate and we see these little alien-like structures um, within the stomach and then it's those larvae that we'll see past in the feces that go on to then pupate and, and become an adult fly. Um, Typically, the bots, like we treat them and we always include them on the list, but their ability to cause overt disease is pretty limited. But they do look very dramatic if we're doing a gastroscopy and running a camera down into the horse's stomach and we see these. And also, uh, they also look pretty dramatic when they're, they're passed in the manure. I think probably more problematic than the, the larval stage in the stomach is that migratory phase through the mouth where they can actually be some inflammation and pain and discomfort that's induced by that larval stage migrating um, through the oral tissues. What other fun pictures that we have in here? I feel like these should, some of these should come with the, the Facebook warning that it's a, a graphic picture. But uh, our other one here is, is pinworms. And this is an actual an egg packet. It's not an adult worm. But with pinworms, we have the adult female worms that reside more proximally in the GI tract, so up in, in the colon, and they come down to the anus and they poke out and they lay these little packets of, of eggs. And those little egg packets and also a little bit of the, the worms moving, that can really induce some itchiness. And so these are really the worms that we affiliate with intense tail rubbing. The large strongyles or the blood worms we can see here, and, uh, if you can appreciate the difference between the small and, and the large, again, you can see that uh, the names make sense. And this was the previously targeted parasite. And these are the ones that can do a migration where the larval stages will actually leave the GI tract and, and migrate up to um, different arteries within the abdomen and create some inflammation that can then um, cause a blood clot that can actually lodge further down in the artery and cut off blood supply to segments of the intestine. So they were quite a scary parasite and it's great to see that they are well controlled and of a low incidence now. And this is one of the reasons that the AEP recommends still a one to two treatments per year to just help keep these at bay. Um, horses have their natural ability to be low shedders for small strong dials, and if we never treated them at all, we may see a recrudescence of this particular worm. And then the worm that will make you stay away from Szechuan noodles are the ascarids. These are the large round worms, and these are the most important target in foals and, and young horses. And that's why a program for a young horse different, differs from what we're discussing here. At some point between you know, six and 18 months, the main parasite changes from ascarid to strondyles. So it's important to do fecal egg counts on our young horses so we can determine what the main parasite is because different dewormers target ascarids more effectively than the ones that target strondyles. Astrid, very uncommonly seen in a mature animal. They do acquire immunity to astrids as, as they mature. So uh, we only very infrequently see astrids in an adult horse. And then the final picture here is just a comparison of uh, the major players on, on one picture. So you get a, 
idea of their relative sizes. So we have the asterids here, which are the large roundworms that in our young horses, if um, they have a large burden and we treat them, they can lead to an asterid impaction. Then there's the, the large strondyles, the ones that you can barely see, the small strondyles, are the female pinworms that, you know, poke their heads out and, and lay eggs. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the common species of, of tapeworms in, in horses. So really, we're building things based around targeting our small strongyles with consideration for tapeworms and then bot pinworms and large strongyles in our mature horses. You know, like I mentioned, there, there are a few major players to consider when we're thinking about what are we going to treat our horses with. And so, you know, we're 20 some minutes in and if you're feeling overwhelmed by all the things to consider about developing a program, just take a deep breath. I'm going to make it easy for you. When it comes to the fall deworming, Quest Plus is the only product available that targets all the parasites concerned in a single dose. The key differentiator for Quest Plus is in its effectiveness against the insisted stages of small strongyles. The other products available, they miss out on one or more key targets. So, you know, something that may be running through your mind right now, like I, I have to promote Quest Plus. I, I work for the company that makes it, but I don't mind saying this because this was my recommendation for fall deworming even before I was on the Zoetis payroll. And it's what I administer to my own horses in the fall. So there are other options for other times of the year, but really when it comes to that fall cornerstone treatment, there really is only one option that ticks all the boxes. So there, you know, for a lot of our horses, we have, you know, half our treatments decided. Quest Plus in the fall. An additional question we need to ask is, is the product that we're considering still efficacious? When it comes to small strondyles, we see some patterns amongst resistance to different products, but in reality, it is a farm by farm consideration and a result of the biology, ecology, and, and selection pressure on that particular operation. So it is good to monitor efficacy or if there's any presence of resistance by performing a fecal egg count reduction test. So this is essentially a before and after treatment egg count to look at the percent reduction in eggs being shed. And it's important to note that these fecal egg count reduction tests, so you take a population of, of horses and you want um, at least six horses per property to do an egg count on, you administer the treatment and then two weeks later, you collect a sample on those, those same horses and compare what their pre and post treatment um, shedding is. And then based on a percentage of, of reduction, you can determine if resistance is present or not. It's not an individual animal thing. It's definitely much um, a parameter that's for your property because if there's resistant parasites, Biologically, there's no way that it, they're just going to be centered in, in one horse in an established herd. Um, if it's a brand new arrival, you may have some separation because he's bringing in some parasites from, from where he was at. That's also a reason why we quarantine new arrivals for at least 96 hours post deworming once we bring a new horse to our place. That's where helping minimize spreading of any resistant parasites they may be harboring. And then we extend that quarantine period for the bacterial infectious diseases that are of concern. So we know amongst the different classes of dewormers, some different trends in resistance. And this is particular to small strongyles, so our main parasite of concern. When we look at the benzimidazole, so that's things like fenbendazole, so the panicures and safeguards, the sciathostomans have widespread resistance to that class of dewormers. 
Then when we look at the pyrimidine, so that's pyrantel, so things like um, strongid and exodus, it's kind of a coin toss as to whether that's going to be effective or not against the small strongile. And then our macrocyclic lactone. So those are the ivermectins and moxidectins, so like the exhalans and bimectins and um, quests that are available. We don't have any reports of resistance amongst small strongiles yet. I think the last thing we looked at was uh, things published up till March 29th. Until that point, we have no reports of resistance, but those early indicators, we're starting to see that shortened egg reappearance period amongst um, those parasites. So it's kind of that, that shot over the bow, if you will, that uh, we need to, you know, kind of turn the ship around and, and, and um, quit going down the path that's selecting for resistance. Because we don't have any new, new products in development um, for controlling equine parasites. So once we lose our, our final class, um, we're going to be in, in big trouble. And like I said, we're going to be in a situation similar to what the, the goat and sheep producers are, are experiencing. So uh, again, just stepping back up on that soapbox, that this is something that's important for us to be able um, to get a hold of. Another consideration when we're looking at product selection, and from the back of our mind all the time is, is this product safe? And you can think of the currently available licensed products in Canada safe when given correctly. And so we have a couple caveats there that um, some horses may require more care and administration, and that's really dependent on their condition. So you want to read the labels to check if safety studies have been done to show if the product is safe in foals, if that's what you're looking at administering to, to pregnant mares, breeding stallions. And then particular care should be given when administering to a sick horse as their metabolism and drug processing abilities are quite altered. And it's really best to work with your veterinarians in, in these cases. And it's also important to, to dose appropriately. And we're going to talk about that um, a little later on this hour. But a lot of the issues that we do see when it runs into an adverse event with a parasite um, product administration is an overdose because we're just notoriously bad at estimating weight and where we really see <laughs> us being off base in our estimations is in miniature horses, in, in foals, and then um, ponies. So those tend to be disproportionately affected by safety issues and it by and large comes down to that they were given the incorrect dose. So um, yeah, just read the labels because they're, um, they're gonna process the drugs a little bit differently. So just be sure to, to be careful with those. And if you ever have any questions, reach out to either the product manufacturer or first line, always your veterinarian. Something else we need to, to be mindful of is the environmental effects of what we're administering. And since the drugs are excreted into the manure, we need to be good stewards in manure handling. And all products that are licensed and available can have a potential effect on local fauna. And if it gets into runoff, can actually affect aquatic species. You know, here at Zoetis, we're, we're pleased to report that moxidectin, so that's the active ingredient in Quest and Quest Plus, has the most bearing effect on dung beetle populations when you look at any of the available macrocyclic lactones. But that's you know, even though it's the safest, it's still important to be good stewards and to minimize what we're putting into the environment, which is what strategic protocols are going to help us to do. And then just another consideration for safety is if we have accidental ingestion by other animals, right? Um, I think, you know, any of us who have dogs at the barn, we, we also, you know, we can appreciate that they have a weird palate and think that a rolled apple is a nice little treat. And some of the questions that we get is, you know, I just deworm my horse yesterday, my dog snuck a, a turd, like, do I need to be worried? And so while the drug is excreted in the manure, 
an, like an average sized dog is going to have to eat between eight and 40 pounds of manure to get to a dose of one milligram per kilogram, which is still a, a safe dose. Um, so it's, you know, manure, you know, if your dog sneaks a, a ball or two, not the end of the world. Um, you're going to have the highest levels in the manure in about the three, the first three days after administration. So be very careful in, in those those first few days and uh, even your manure disposal at that time if you're worried about environmental contamination that can be um, not gone into compost but rather disposed of um, in in the garbage but of, of more concern than your your dog sneaking a road apple is if uh, they get into a tube of the actual product itself like say you know your dog chews into a tube um, or you know you have some product that falls out of your horse's mouth onto the ground and your dog happens to lap it up before you're able to do anything. Um, it's best to work with your, your veterinarian to minimize the absorption of, of the product. We don't have a specific antidote to, to moxidectin. Um, so if it's a, a large enough dose, you can start to see some effects. Um, drowsiness is going to be one of the um, major ones that, that you see. Um, it is important to note that moxidectin is, is administered directly to dogs for their own parasite control, but we just need to be careful of, of the dose. Um, so these are just things to, to keep in mind from a safety aspect of the products that we're administering. And that, as we're looking at some other factors besides the, the who, the what and the when, we need to consider what we're doing and how we're managing our operations. If horses are in, in dry lot pens at a low stocking density or have manure removed frequently, they're gonna be exposed to less larvae than horses at pasture in higher densities. Like really, a horse needs to have access to grazing to be exposed to small strongyle larvae. I think sometimes we think of, you know, a horse being in a dry lot pen um, as being more prone to parasitism, but the, the reverse is actually true. The picture that's up there is a water droplet on a plant stalk. And if you look carefully, that's not just reflection. Those are actually um, infective stage larvae. So L3 larvae of small strongyles. So your horse will eat that and ingest those, those larvae and continue the life cycle of the parasite. Within the biology of the parasites, it's important to remember that when your horse passes those eggs in the manure, they're not immediately infective. They do have to go through a maturation phase um, from egg to larvae and actually through three stages of larvae before they can be infective to another horse. So an important measure of control is removing that manure before those eggs have a chance to develop into an infective stage. There's actually been some European studies done where they have um, a pasture vacuum, it's like a pasture room, but is how I uh, have it pictured, but really it was a product that was used for golf course maintenance, but they use that to um, to clean the horse pastures, and that was as effective as any um, excuse me any product based program. It's just that those those little vacuum units are quite expensive. I think golf courses can justify their expense, but the average horse owner probably cannot afford their their pasture Roomba. And, and then finally, with management factors, cross-grazing with other species can help decrease the larval burdens. So the larvae are species-specific. So if you're rotating grazing with sheep or goats or cattle herds, that can be beneficial because the cross-species will kind of vacuum up um, their larvae, or they'll just be a, a long enough period of time that uh, the larvae um, die waiting for another another host to to come along. I did just want to take a moment to talk about some of the alternative and natural therapies that are out there. There's a whole lot of other things out there that have been given to horses with the goal of reducing worm burdens. I think you guys can probably all add a couple others 
to the list, but you know, you see different forums where they're talking about different herbs, different plants, different essential oils. Um, and, and really like these, these parasites have existed in, in horses for many, many years, and they're pretty much adapted to any forage-based thing we can, can throw at them. Uh, probiotics have been discussed, um, suggested as, as a deworming agent, um, and it's not really, they're not really gonna out-compete a, a parasite there. The probiotics do have, have benefits for horses' overall health, but it's not gonna actually rid them of, of any parasites. You know, there's things like pumpkin and bran that have, have been um, suggested. And I'm not sure if that's just like a bulk fiber type of thing, but to clean out a, a horse's colon, you're gonna have to provide quite quite a lot of those things. So uh, yeah, I can't say pumpkin or bran is gonna be anything that I hang my, my hat on. They do make nice muffins, but uh, not for parasite control. I think if we consider diatomaceous earth specifically uh, this is probably one I hear most commonly and now I think where we we get a little crossover is it is really great for garden pests right and, and keeping unwanted things out of out of the garden but it works there by drying out the exoskeletons of, of the little creepy crawlers that are trying to get into the garden and so you know horses intestines are, are not dry so the diatomaceous earth isn't going to work in that same manner I have also some, you know, heard some theory that it's working as an abrasive agent on on the worm, and no, it, it's it's not doing that either. Um, and also, if it was abrasive enough to grind a worm into submission or you know to compromise it, what do you think it would be doing to the wall of the horse's colon, right? So that just that that one doesn't pass the sniff test either. But so bottom line on these alternative or natural therapies is that none have been proven to be effective. Um, so at best, they do nothing, or maybe they help out the GI tract in, in another way. But at worst, they can be harmful or toxic. And if this is a, a route that you're considering, um, I think it's best to uh, still be monitoring this you know, test the effectiveness of this yourself in, in your horses and, and be doing fecal egg counts so that you have a true idea if what you're implementing has has value. Um, I think that's where the, the proof is, is going to be for, for some of these uh, alternative therapies. But that doesn't mean there aren't any, you know, this quote unquote chemical free options for parasite control. You know, besides the elbow grease, like in manure removal or those, those pasture uh, vacuums, there, there are these nematophagus fungi. So that's just worm eating fungal spores. So there's a, a ubiquitous strain of fungus, this dudding, dudding tonia flagrans, that, that sounds very British, um, but it traps nematodes with its hyphae. It's available in other countries as a feed through product, but it's not currently licensed in North America. So these spores are included in the feed and then they pass through the animal inertly and they're packed in the bowel movement with the eggs. And as the eggs larvate, the fungus grows these hyphae that entrap and then eat the larvae. So it's a pretty neat use of ecology. And maybe someday they will be available in Canada so that we can use them as part of a parasite control system. So, so now that we've discussed who to treat, when to treat considerations and, and with what, our next consideration is, what is this gonna cost me? You may be surprised by what you find out here as we go through some number crunching about the cost effectiveness about these strategic parasite control programs. So for whole horse numbers, let's consider a herd of 10 horses. And it, I mean, really, who just has one horse? But this is so, you know, our, our math works out. We have whole horse numbers. In the old blanket treatment protocol, each horse would have been treated four to six times per year, meaning 40 to 60 doses of product would have been administered. 
if we look at our AEP recommendations of that one to two treatment per year, regardless of fecal egg count, with an additional one to two treatments during the seasons of transmission for moderate and high shedders, it starts to break out like this. We, we know that 50 to 75% of horses are low shedders and would require that foundational one to two treatments per year. And then we have this middle class of moderate shedders, you know, typically between five and 15% that would be at three times per year for treatment. And then we have our group of high shedders that is between 10 and 30%, and those would be treated four times per year. So when we look at our strategic control program, just looking at the common statistics of that uh, dispersion pattern, we'd be at 30 doses for, for this group, kind of at the high end, like this was, you know, saying our high shadows were at 30. And again, this distribution does vary a bit by, by, by herd. You know, it could very well be that you have a whole herd of, of low shedders. But generally, we see this breakdown. And so then we, when we can consider our, our cost comparison, so we're back here with our blanket protocol. So in that first year, because you're just reflexively treating everyone and you're not determining who's high, medium, or low, you don't have those fecal egg count costs, but you'd be using 40 to 60 doses of, of product. And then when we look at our strategic program, we'd have this product cost of, of 30 doses, and then our fecal egg count for 10 horses, and this is some ballpark figuring, you know, 20 to $30. Some vet practices are gonna be less, and, and some are, are going to be more. And so when we look into our second year, again, no fecal egg count cost for our blanket protocol, 40 to 60 doses, and, and that's just going to, you know, be that easy, easy multiplier year after year. For our strategic program, in our second year, we really don't have to incur a fecal egg count cost. And this is because mature horses are relatively consistent with their fecal egg count. Low shedders tend to be low shedders, high shedders tend to be high shedders. So we can do these classification fecals only every couple, you know, two to three years. Uh, as long as there's no major change in, in, in health status or they don't have a major colic episode otherwise, or they're not relocated to a new property. Um, so you don't incur that fecal egg count cost every year. And so we start to see um, over the, the course of two years that we're, you know, we're substantially reducing our product cost compared to the, the blanket protocols. And so we can see from our previous slide that the economics depend on really what the cost of sequels are and then the cost of dewormer. And I'm just gonna have a very brief interjection here to provide a word of caution about the, the cheap generic deworming products that are available, especially you know, stateside. You know, we hear lots of reports and I've had clients that, you know, yeah, we're down in Great Falls and we're just gonna pick this up and you, you get this very kind of nondescript tube. And I do have grave concerns about the quality, potency, and purity of those products. Um, I would really encourage you to buy a product from a reputable company that will stand behind their product in the event that anything happens. Um, I, you know, owning horses, yes, is expensive, but this is not the place to, to save those dollars. There's a lot more effective cost saving strategy when it comes to horses than, um, buying uh, kind of that product X. And, and that's really all I'm, I'm gonna say about that. Um, but when you're looking at kind of those average costs of um, kind of reputable products, you can see that your strategic control program is gonna have a cost saving for you with the added benefit of being best practice and minimizing resistance pressure on your horse. So I hope by now you should be thinking, well, you know, how do I get a fecal egg count done? So I'm just gonna give you a few guidelines if you're collecting the, the samples yourself. 
So fecal egg count, so this is, you know, bowel movements. You want it to be nice road apples. Diarrhea samples are not, not good for analysis and also not convenient for you to collect. But uh, these samples need to be taken at an appropriate time. So this is greater than four weeks past that egg reappearance period of, of whatever product you had used previously, um, collected fresh uh, so that the eggs aren't, aren't damaged and we're unable to uh, recover them and, and count them. And then also when it's fresh, you can identify which horse that they came from. You only need three to four fecal balls. Um, and what we analyze out of that is a representative sample. We take little pinches from throughout the, the sample that you provide. You don't need a full, um, a full shovel full. And I just kind of laugh as I say that because I had a client who brought me like the big uh, freezer bag full when we're at the grocery store. You know, the joy of living in a, in a small town is, you know, you run into people at um, kind of routine places, but I, I can't say that I need to take a, a full, a full horse bowel movement um, to my veterinarian at, at the grocery store. So three to four fecal balls per horse is sufficient. Um, put each sample in a separate labeled airtight container. Again, you know, we like to think we know your horse as well, but we can't identify them by, by their poop. So make sure you put your horse's name on there and then just squish, squish the air out. That's like those freezer seal bags work well for this purpose. Um, you're gonna wanna keep them from freezing. Freezing distorts um, the larvae or pardon me, the eggs that are in there so it can um, alter the results if it's a frozen sample. And you do want to submit them within 48 hours. It's not like you have to submit them, you know, immediately after collection. But uh, for most consistent results, we do want to analyze them within, within two days. And yeah, these are just some guidelines that I'd like to provide you with, but it's best practice just to confirm the protocol with, with your veterinarian. But pretty, pretty straightforward. And I mean, you can, <laughs> It's like a watch pot never boils. If you're, you know, waiting for your, your horse to poop, just pop them on the trailer. Um, you know, works every time. So I'm just gonna have Jocelyn pop up our third polling question here. Cause we need to address giving our horses the right dose. So how do you know how much your horse weighs? So do you eyeball it? Do you use a weigh tape? A weigh by difference at the truck scale. So you run your horse across in the trailer and then take your rig across empty and, and do a little math there. Or you measure uh, your horse and, and use a formula. And I think, you know, a lot of us, like we, we, we do eyeball it a lot of the time, but um, when it comes to being accurate in our administration, we, we do need to have some accuracy. So, you know, a third of us are, are eyeballing it. Um, you know, half the people uh, participating today are, are using a, a weigh tape. And uh, we got one, one number cruncher who, who measures and, and uses a formula. So again, a, a bit of a, a break. Uh, nobody's actually physically weighing their horse on, on a truck scale. It's good to see that, you know, some people are, are using those, those tapes. Let's see if I can advance this. So we really need to get the right weight. And this is crucial to using the product correctly. And there really is no shame in, in using a tool to help determine your horse's weight. Like I said, scales aren't readily available. And then really we are all bad at, at eyeballing. This is not to offend anyone on, on the call today, but uh, there's actually been some, some studies done that, that looks at um, the accuracy of, of different methods of determining a, a horse's weight. Um, you know, the best of us are, are, and I don't include myself as, as, as the best of us, but are off by at least 10% in visual appraisal and typically closer to 20 to 25% off when we're just looking at um, a guesstimate of, of their weight. Um, so 
really underdosing is another practice that promotes resistance. So we need to make sure that we are fairly accurate in what we are doing. There's some useful calculators available online. If you know punching numbers isn't your thing, you just have to add in the horse's measurement. So the one at thehorse.com uses heart girth and and body length, similar to a measurement that you'd use for for blankets, and then it it gives you um, a weight estimate. That's that's pretty, uh, you know, definitely within five percent of of true. And then there's an app for uh, calculating your horse's weight. There's truly an app for, for everything, but the Healthy Horse app is, is quite handy. And I, I have this on, on my iPhone. And what's nice about it is that you, you put in these measurements, like similar to the, the heart girth and, and the body length, but you also have a, a spot to select what kind of body type or breed your horse is. And they have some specific um, equations for determining your horse's weight estimate from from that. So those are, are pretty handy tools. And then also the like the weight tapes that are, are available are also um, an acceptable measure. But um, while they're while they're not perfect, they're certainly more accurate than than eyeballing. So um, if uh, I have permitted one final soapbox moment here, it's uh, to know your horse's weight accurately because that is critical in determining the right dose so again there is absolutely no shame it doesn't make you any less of a, a horse person in using a tool um, to measure for accuracy i think it's probably more shameful to use the the incorrect dose so just as we're winding up here um, the benefits of our strategic parasite control programs is that they effectively control parasite burdens. We get to minimize the number of treatments that are being administered. They slow the development of resistance. They're cost effective and best practice. So, you know, that take home message is you need to use the right product at the right dose in the right horse at the right time. Um, so if you can just, yeah, take that home with you today, I think you'd be well on your way to developing these, these programs within your own, your own herd. And so if there's any questions, uh, feel free to, to pass them along now or reach out to us afterwards. Um, yeah, we have one more installment and I believe that's, that's next week. I was, I was very excited about the, the Paris. I was you know, ready to roll last week with it. And uh, Jocelyn let me know kindly that it was, it was this week. So that's just, uh, we'll, we'll be ready for next week as, as well. And I know, so these are, are programs that are based for mature horses. If you have questions about what to do with your younger horses, please uh, reach out and we can, we can walk you through uh, the particulars of, of dealing with horses that are under three years old. Uh, we just have a question here from Kayla. Uh, what does it mean by shedders? Oh, okay, good, good question. It's not just, just shedding hair. So shedding is, um, the amount of eggs that a horse is is shedding into the environment from the parasite load that that they're carrying. So they they vary. Like some horses um, will have a, a lower parasite burden, and so those would be low shedders because they have less adults to put the eggs um, back into the environment, and then moderate and and high. And we often see that um, like our fecal egg counts are reported in eggs per gram, and we have different cutoffs. Um, low shedders are less than 200 eggs per gram, and then moderate are you know, between you know, two and 500, and then over 500 would be our, our high shedders. And uh, those cut points are just arbitrarily determined by um, you know, people looking at, at these things. So like, is, is that a hard and fast cutoff? No, probably not. And uh, that's why we recommend if your horse is, is near one of those cutoff points that we repeat their, uh, their 
fecal egg count more frequently. Okay, I guess anyone have uh, any more questions for Dr. Kwasnick? Um, feel free. Oh, there's one uh, from Arlene. Best time in the fall, early or late, to deworm? Yeah, uh, good question, Arlene. Um, you know, early or late. You know, we've typically had, you know, there's been this historical, like, after the first frost. Um, we don't really need to wait for a first frost or that, that killing frost. But I would say, like, as your horses are coming off pasture, so as you're, as you're getting into um, the start of October, mid-October would be, would be good times to, to be considering deworming. Good question. Anyone else? Oh, here's another one. Oh, from Marlene. How long before moving to a new barn should we deworm? Yeah, I think it's, if you know your horses is going, like, um, I would deworm them and, and give them 96 hours um, because, you know, what, what's passed in, in the manure, um, you know, you kind of have them a little more, more cleaned out then um, so that you're not, you know, um, you're less likely to, to pass things on to um, a, new, a new property where you have their, their levels low so they're not contaminating a lot. So it doesn't have to be weeks and weeks in advance, just a few days. Anybody else? Any more questions? And if you do think of something, again, um, Dr. Kwasnick's email address is up on the screen. Um, or you can always email us at Horse Council and we can pass the question along to her as well. Um, if you want to recap what we just heard today, uh, the presentation will be on the Horse Council website. Uh, probably Jocelyn by tomorrow. I would say. Uh, yeah, end of today or early tomorrow. Yeah, so you can just pop on there and um, go over anything again. Um, and we would like to invite you to join us next Wednesday, July 22nd at one o'clock again. Um, and Dr. Kwasnick will be speaking on the topic of good nutrition is good medicine. Um, so she'll be examining how nutrition has an important impact on horse health year round. So that'll be a really good one. Um, be sure to tune in and thank you for joining us. And thank you, Zoitis. Uh, Zoitis again has provided us with some door prizes. So everyone on the call will be getting a little email um, and uh, we'll be in contact to get you your door prizes. So thank you, Zoitis, and thank you, Dr. Kwasnick, and everybody have a great day. Hey, Sandy, uh, before you go, can you hear me? Yeah. It's Gord Cole. You're calling from Zoetis. Um, can you make that shareable, um, the, the recorded version of this? And, and was the other one recorded as well on the immunology? Yes. Because that would be great to get that out there. I think there's a lot of people just on the timing of this that would love to get uh, that information to into the Absolutely. Hand. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it's uh, all the presentations are recorded and they will all be on the Horse Council YouTube channel and on the website. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. All right. Catch everyone next week. Okay, that's a wrap. Thanks. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>